Hello, my name is Kenji Oshino. I'm the founder and CEO of Infinite Scope. I run a successful business that will likely never turn a profit. I'm living my dream right now, but it barely pays the rent. We live in a culture in which the success of a business is largely determined based on dollars and not impact. Through running my own business, I've been able to radically redefine what success means to me. And here's how you can do it too. Step one, disappoint the people that care about you the most. <laughs> now, it's particularly important that you disappoint these people because the people who care about you the most never want to see anything bad happen to you. They want you to live an easy, generally low-risk life. But the people who never take risks generally don't make any change. So about the time that my voice dropped, my parents told me and convinced me that I was going to be a professor or a doctor or a lawyer, because in my family, those were the only acceptable options. Growing up, conversations around the dinner table would start with, well, Kenji, when you get your PhD. <laughs> now, luckily, when I came to Grinnell, I really enjoyed studying chemistry, and that path to the PhD was laid out in front of me. But there was a problem. I did not want to go to graduate school. I didn't. I enjoyed studying chemistry, but I knew in my inside that like, going to graduate school for it just wasn't for me. This was confirmed when I was at the American Chemical Society conference in Anaheim during my senior year. I was presenting research at a poster presentation, and I looked around, and I realized that there were about 3,000 people in that room that cared way more about this than I did. And it was at that moment, though, I realized I was never going to get a PhD, and I had no idea how I was going to be facing my family. Now, while this advice and this step is easy to tell someone to do. It's incredibly hard to do yourself, I know that. But hear me, I've disappointed quite a few people in my life, and I can honestly tell you that the fear of letting them down is far worse than actually letting anyone down. And to be honest, if I had taken more time to try to understand the rationale for their expectations, I'd have learned that what they wanted was just what they thought was best for me, what they thought would help provide a safe and secure and happy life. So step two, discover your passions. So while everyone assumed that I was hard at work on my way to going to graduate school, I began taking classes outside of the science building. My first semester, I took stagecrafting and fell in love with technical theater. I started taking art classes, and I found my creative voice in wood and metalworking. I learned that I loved the sciences and arts equally, but I struggled to figure out how I was going to try to combine these into a career of these seemingly incompatible interests. <sighs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I took the fifth year technical internship as a way of deferring my decision to go to graduate school. But the summer after I graduated, before I started working full time in the theater, I was awarded a fellowship to teach children science at the local public library here in Grinnell. I developed and performed a show called Try This at Home that taught basic concepts of biology, physics, and chemistry to children through hands-on experiments. Think Bill Nye, but with a lot more explosions. <laughs> I discovered that summer that my passion, my passion was getting people excited about science to help them see the application of science in their everyday lives. And Try This at Home was the fusion of all of my interests. It was a theatrical performance, and it required a lot of creativity to make these science lessons relevant to children. So after I worked in the theater for a year, I jumped over to my other passion for a while and found a job at the Science Learning Center here at the college. This was the first time I really felt since being a student that I had some time to breathe and explore my interests. I was making my living tutoring chemistry students during the day, but at night, I was exercising my mind by tinkering. And it was around this time, five years ago, that I developed my first smartphone microscope. I invented a tool that could transform any smart device into a portable digital scope with just $10 worth of material from the hardware store. And with this scope, I figured out I could do, I could recreate simple biology experiments that I had done in high school. And it was at that moment, I realized this could have a big impact on some people's education. The scope was portable, it was durable, you can take photos and video with it, and it can be used by multiple people at a time. I knew I couldn't keep this to myself, this I had to share. I wanted everyone else to feel that same discovery and sense of wonder that I did. I wanted to democratize science by providing an alternative to expensive and difficult to use scopes. And it was obvious to me at the time, the best way to share this idea with as many people as possible was to give the plan away for free. 
So I did. I published the plans on YouTube and on Instructables.com. And the YouTube video quickly climbed to over a million views. And I started hearing back from teachers around the world that were using my microscope in their classrooms. But it just wasn't just teachers and scientists that adopted and embraced this open source scope. My inbox was full of messages ranging everywhere from children that had video recorded paramecium swimming in pond water to nature photographers that were taking photos of snowflakes. I was surprised how quickly the maker community adopted the scope. I was even more surprised just to see quite how many of them modified it, customized it for their own needs. And then they would share those ideas, their remixes back with that online community. I truly believe that it was that sense, that feeling of shared ownership and collaboration that allowed the microscope to reach as many people as it did. So, step three. Find every reason you can not to try. Now, I was very pleased with the reception of the smartphone microscope on the online community. I really was. I, I thought it was amazing that the maker community had really made it their own, and they came up with applications for that device that I would never have dreamed of. But that excitement was quickly replaced by anxiety. I started getting messages about, where is your next big invention? And why can't I buy this on Amazon? Or a $10 microscope, really? How about the $800 smart device required to make it work? Oh, that was valid. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I started to feel like a bit of an imposter. I really did. I thought the design might have been a fluke. I felt a lot of pressure to continue designing, not because I wanted to, but because I felt I had to prove myself. Also, I had a lot of friends and family that just could not understand my reasons for wanting to give the scope away. They decided that decision was foolish. You should have patented that and made a lot of money. All the while, I had incredible mentors here at Grinnell, both in the arts and the sciences, and they supported me every step of the way. But the weight that I should have given their opinions I gave instead to random people on the internet. Yeah, I, um, I was convinced. What I felt most during this time, what I remember most from it, was an overwhelming feeling of isolation and doubt. I was convinced that there was no way that I could make a living in science education. I'd allowed the, the expectations of a few strangers and people who didn't know me or my goals to stop me from even trying. So step four, find a reason to say fuck it. Um, <laughs> a few more years in Grinnell, and eventually the job that I held at the local art residency ceased to exist, and I moved back home to central New York. Now at this time, I had a lot more experience working with children with my microscope, having done a lot of outreach events similar to Try This at Home, but at children's museums, hospitals, libraries, and maker spaces. I also knew that if I wanted to continue sharing the idea of the microscope, I was going to have to do so directly. Back at home, I knew all the local teachers and the schools, and that would be enough for me to get my foot in the door. But more importantly, I knew that I had nothing to lose by trying. And I would probably always regret not taking this opportunity. So I started a small business. The plan was to start working with the K-12 teachers, integrating my scope into their science, technology, and art curriculum. It was a good plan, except I knew nothing about how to run a business. <laughs> um, sure, I was good at teaching kids science, but that only turned out to be like 10% of the actual job. After struggling for a year trying to work with schools, I started using the local business resources. I joined two entrepreneurial incubators, and I was received a state grant, and in 2017, we formed my company, Infinite Scope. So step five. Make sure what you've started is what you want to continue. Now, Infinite Scope's goals were the same as mine when we first released the original $10 smartphone microscope. We wanted to make science accessible by providing tools to let people explore and then share their discoveries. We wanted to see the scope in as many people's hands as possible. My entrepreneurial mentors saw a lot of potential in our product. They gave us expert advice on how to grow the business and urged us to redesign the scope into a commercial grade product that we would sell directly to consumers online. Here again, I had a path that was laid out directly in front of me. And as long as I didn't stray from it, I got their approval. So we were coached on how to pitch our business, how to talk to investors, how to identify the pain points of our target audience. 
And all of those skills turned out to be invaluable to us as I started exhibiting at trade shows, maker fairs, and education conferences. We redesigned the scope. We improved the optics. We made it more durable, made it more user friendly. We had had feedback from hundreds of teachers. And we had demonstrated the product to over 30,000 people. We were confident we were making a better microscope, but I became increasingly uncomfortable with the business itself. You see, in, in the name of trying to increase profits and keep our costs down, we had to consider a lot of things that I didn't particularly like, like moving manufacturing out of the region and out of the country, and to possibly have to withhold content, upgrades, and material from our users so that we could try to sell it to them at a later time. Now, these business practices aren't considered unethical, but they did get me to pause and really consider the methods that we were using to advance the mission. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you see, to me, the business was a means to an end. It always was. Not a means or an end in itself. And I had conflated the two, what it meant to be a successful business and how to fulfill our mission. Many people had told us, or we believed, that to be a successful business, we had to grow, make profits, get the product on the store shelves, maybe get on a shark tank, but eventually sell the company for profit and start another venture. We didn't want those things. We never wanted those things. We just wanted to share an idea. So step six, move forward boldly and repeat step five as necessary. Now, for someone else, the path that we were being urged to follow might have worked. I just knew it wasn't working for me. So we started to stand back and think about what was the original goal of our company. It was to share this idea with the largest audience, as many people as we could. And we thought back to when I originally released the original $10 smartphone microscope. We were sharing an idea, not selling it. We realized that when we gave those plans over to a community of people, it was you know, once we were no longer the arbiter of who got to use this thing or got to hear about it, that it was able to be free and uh, grow organically. It was able to reach people that we had no contacts with, people that we didn't even know existed. We realized that for infinite scope to be a success as we defined it, we needed to give the plans away again. So here's what we're doing now. We redesigned the scope and I'm proud to say that in two weeks, we'll be publishing the plans to Eureka, an open source 3D printable smartphone microscope. Now anybody who has access to a 3D printer will be able to make our scope on their own for free. Now, we don't know what's going to happen when we release Eureka, we don't. But we know that we'll likely have to repeat step five and sort of check to make sure that what we're doing is what we intended to in the first place. And many of our mentors and the people that we've talked to about our newest business model fully expect us to fail. Some of them probably even want us to, on their terms. But to me, to my mind, anything that happens once we've released these plans online, made them available so people can see them, download them, and use them, our business will be a complete success. So now, now you all have a choice. You can go out there and chase the approval of others and be judged by their expectations, or you can go out and chase your dreams and define success on your own terms. You know the choice I made. And to be honest, it would be really hypocritical of me right now to stand up here and tell you what you should do. But if there is one thing I can leave you with, one bit of advice that I would encourage you to act on, it's to go out there and disappoint someone. Because that, that is the first step to succeeding on your own terms. And here's the secret. No, Here's the truth. You do not need their approval. You don't. Because only you can define success for yourself, and you don't need anyone's permission, permission to chase your dreams. Thank you very much for listening.